Thank you. Heather, will you please call the roll? Phyllis McKee? Here. Tom Grinstead? Here. Garrett O'Brien? Here. Ali Taishi? Here. Steve Crooks? Here. Lisa Anderson? Here. Jeff Gray? Here. All right, full house. Uh, there are no minutes uh, to review, so we'll move past that and we will open a public comment period. And so this is an opportunity to, if you'd like to speak about anything other than tonight's topic, which is the um, update to the marijuana regulations ordinance, then you have three minutes. You can come up and talk about anything you want. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, you can. Perfect. Uh, All right. To. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So seeing no one who wants to speak, we will close the public comment period and just roll right into our, um, it's not really a public hearing, right, Kurt? It's more like a, just a. If this is the starting, yes. the starting point, it's kind starting of an point. introduction. Um, what we wanted to do was uh, introduce the Planning Commission into rules and regulations about marijuana. It's been a very complicated uh, industry, new, new industry, and so we wanted to brief you on it before the rules actually came forward with that. Um, there was a little bit of lack of communication on our part uh, explaining that to you, uh, so I greatly apologize about that and getting the materials out to you. Um, we do would like to continue this from tonight and keep everything open, keep the record open until most likely December 15th. That's what we're hoping for. That's the next uh, available or one of the next available planning commission meetings. So December 15th is when we would like to actually show you the rules and regulations and have you comment on them. Have public, public comment at that point once there's something for them to review. Correct. Okay. Well, take it away. So I guess with that, um, as I mentioned, uh, tonight we're here to talk about uh, marijuana and the rules and regulations that govern it, both Washington State as well as uh, the City of Bellingham rules. Um, as I said, this is a pretty complex situation uh, due to the rules that have been adopted over the years. Uh, just a little background on the legislative history of marijuana. Uh, since 1970, federal laws prohibited the manufacturing possession of marijuana. Uh, this is, it's been classified as a Schedule I drug. Uh, that's one of the worst drugs that you can actually have from the federal level. So um, even though the state and the city have enacted rules and regulations regarding marijuana, it is still against federal law. That in itself has uh, made uh, this new industry very complicated to regulate. Um, However, back in 1998, uh, the citizens of Washington State uh, believed that the use of medical marijuana or marijuana for medical purposes was something that should be explored. Um, and in 1998, we passed Initiative 692 regarding medical marijuana, and it actually created an affirmative defense for qualifying patients um, with terminally or debilitating illnesses, and in order to, to qualify, you had to have some sort of uh, physician recommendation on that. Um, and what you would do is you would go in, um, you would go through a doctor's visit, they would evaluate your condition and concerns, and then you could go get a medical marijuana card, and that's how you could purchase medical marijuana. Um, and that actually went on for quite some time. Uh, then as more and more, they, states across the, uh, the nation started to adopt rules and regulations. Um, we felt as a state that we needed some more rules governing how it was starting to occur. Um, and in 2011, the Washington State Legislature passed um, in Gross Senate Bill 5073. And what this did was this actually established possession amounts. Before, there weren't rules about that, and you could have as much as you could carry, essentially. Um, it also created the legal basis for licensing of medical cannabis dispensaries. Um, we wanted to make sure that people could actually get access to it. Um, and it allowed, in a way that it did that, is it allowed collective gardens. Um, however, right after the legislature passed this bill, uh, the governor actually vetoed a great section, a great majority of the rules in this, uh, this bill. Um, unfortunately, what that did is that created a tremendous amount of confusion because the way that she uh, vetoed some of these things that essentially said that dispensaries or collective gardens simply were not allowed. Uh, so you had all of these businesses that were out there, um, some paying taxes, some not paying taxes, some selling a lot amounts, some not, some doing it out of their back houses, some doing it in, 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 off, uh, in businesses and streets, and so it became very complicated. Um, 
Then, that's the medical, that's kind of the medical side. Then what we did in 2012, um, the Washington State voters approved Initiative 502. And now Initiative 502 was specific to recreational use. Um, and what it did was it decriminalized for purposes of state law, because again, remember, it's still against federal law, um, the production, processing, distribution, sale, uh, and possession of marijuana as long as you did it in compliance with the initiative. Um, this also authorized the Liquor, Liquor Control Board at that time. It's now known as the Liquor and Cannabis Board. Um, it allowed them to regulate and to tax marijuana uh, for, purposes, for persons that were 21 years of age or older. It also added new thresholds for driving under the influence of marijuana. Uh, before, it was very hard to determine what portions of THC levels were being uh, required and uh, what you were being tested against. Um, as part of Initiative 502, it also allowed the licensing and the production or the licensing for production, processing, and retailing of marijuana. Um, some of the uniquenesses of this law also established sitting restrictions or siting restrictions for marijuana facilities. And that was, there's a thousand foot buffer that was incorporated into the rules. And the reason that they did this is because they wanted to try to keep the production and the retailing of marijuana away from uh, children, specifically those under the age of 18 and 21. Uh, so they looked at areas and types of uses that had con high concentrations of children. So what they said is you can't locate any type of marijuana facility within a thousand feet of a school, elementary, um, or middle school, or high school, um, any sort of playgrounds, city parks, um, libraries, transit centers, uh, child care centers, rec centers. So they threw this large net around it and there was a lot of rules and regulations regarding, well, how do you measure that? Is it, is it how the, the, bird, the crow flies or is it the most direct travel? Um, and this was actually, what they settled on was how the crow flies. And just to give you an idea of what that does, I'm gonna switch over really quick. So here what you can see is we've got, um, you can see the, the city of Bellingham and then we've got a lot of these kind of buffered areas and circled areas and all of these are restricted properties and uses. Some of the ones that are in red were ones that we didn't know about. We said, well, these, these may fit the definition so we wanna make sure that we're extra careful about some of those. But what you can see is those buffer rules really, um, limited where marijuana production facilities could possibly go. So one of the other things that uh, Initiative 502 did was it required the Liquor and Cannabis Board to adopt specific rules by December 1 of 2013. Now all these other rules that we just talked about were already incorporated into the actual initiative that, that the citizens voted on. However, there weren't the specifics and the details of how you were gonna license, how many licenses should there be, how much should we allow to grow, where should they be able to go? And so the initiative said, okay, Liquor Control, or Liquor and Cannabis Board, you need to actually adopt specific rules um, regarding these uses. So what did that mean to us as a city? Well, we said, gosh, we really need to get control of this. Um, and what, what ways do we have out there to make sure that some of these operations don't go into effect before we actually have our own city rules, local rules and regulations in place? Uh, so what we did, and this is what the city council actually did, is we presented a moratorium enacted on all recreational marijuana facilities. Um, the city, the state law actually allows the city council to enact moratoriums or interim zoning controls. Um, and they do that in order to preserve status quo um, while you're 
looking at rules and regulations or for other life safety and health, health issues. Um, we believed that this was something that we needed to do so that we could kind of let these rules get promulgated and we can try to create rules to establish that. And then we also at that time still didn't really know what the effects of um, marijuana were and, and how, uh, if whether or not from a city's perspective, we wanted to allow regulations um, or regulate marijuana or even allow it for that matter. Um, there's been some court cases recently that said that local jurisdictions do have the authority to um, prohibit them in their, their jurisdictions. The state can still issue the, the license, but the local jurisdiction does have that authority to deny that. Um, so um, that was a, for dealing with recreational marijuana. We also knew that we had this that the, the I-502 only dealt with the recreational component, the recreational use, but we also knew that we had the medical marijuana operations that were still occurring out there, and we didn't, we knew that this wasn't, something needed to happen because we had uh, medical rules saying one thing and recreational rules saying another thing. Um, however, we wanted to make sure that people, the city council really felt strongly that they wanted to make sure that folks using medical marijuana still had access to it. Um, so what we did is we created interim rules and interim zoning for collective gardens. Um, and this was sitting, again, the siting rules. What we thought was really important here is we kind of were trying to look into the future and realize uh, what was going to happen with marijuana regulations overall. We were hoping, and there was a lot of um, discussion at this time, that somewhere along the line, the medical marijuana rules and the recreational rules would be kind of come together and be consolidated and there would be one rule for marijuana. Um, that was what most of the jurisdictions were hoping. That's what many of the state legislatures were hoping as well. And so we took a gamble and we said, well, the recreational rules established by the initiative are pretty good. They've got some really good ideas behind them um, and some regulations, such as the, the siting rules, having buffers for specific uses. So what we did is we crafted our interim rules for collective gardens kind of based on the recreational rules that were already out there. We also knew that collective gardens, what a, what's supposed to take place in a collective garden with a concept is, is that a group of people qualifying patients or providers of patients could come together, pool their resources, and grow their own, own medicine. That was kind of the thought behind collective gardens. Um, now, because you were growing, we wanted to make sure that we, we knew that growing of, of marijuana, there were some, possibly some concerns with that, um, most, mostly smell um, when the flowers come to budding and right before they are harvesting them, there's a, a very distinctive odor with marijuana. So uh, we said, well, where are our uses that have noises and smells and different things like that? And those are our industrial zones. In industrial zones, you're subject to all different kinds of noises and smells out there. So we felt it was appropriate to put this type of um, operation in our industrial zones. Uh, one of the things we also wanted to make sure is that we only allowed for outdoor growing or indoor growing and operation. We didn't want big outdoor fields in a city and in an urban environment. Um, we just didn't feel that it was appropriate for our, in, our environment. We also um, adopted signage regulations, making sure that, again, trying to protect the, the, the younger generation and the, the minors. That was an intent, again, so that they're not seen and it's not out there a lot. Um, and then one of the things that we also wanted to make sure is we adopted specific nuisance rules regarding that because of the smells and the concerns that were out there. We wanted to make sure that we were really clear that just because you were growing it, you couldn't create a distinctive nuisance in the city. Um, part of those original rules that weren't vetoed by the governor also allowed for personal use. Um, and you could actually grow for yourself in your house. So um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that that was regulated in a somewhat distinct manner as well. Um, there, at that time, there were um, 
everything from TV shows uh, to in the, in the paper of houses in other jurisdictions and states of being converted to grow operations for marijuana. Uh, so we thought that it was appropriate based on the number of plants that people could have and the grow for their personal grow that we would restrict that area. Uh, inside their homes. So we didn't want people growing it in their garages. We wanted them to be still very secluded. Um, so we limited, we said you had to grow it inside your house in a very limited size. Um, one of the growing operations that people do is they use different types of gases to help accelerate the growth of it. Um, butane, CO2, those are all things that people use. So we wanted to control that too because we didn't want people that maybe were not very experienced with this going, blowing up houses and things like that, creating fire issues. Uh, so we've got, we adopted specific rules on the use of types of gas. Um, we also knew that the typical uh, electrical currents and circuits that are out for a single family home have pretty distinct limitations on them. And so what we did is we put uh, thresholds for lighting. Um, we didn't want to make sure, we wanted to make sure that people weren't over powering their circuits and, and such, so we had these thresholds on that. And again, also on, on indoor. Now remember, this is only for um, medical marijuana, and you had to have, you had to be determined that you were a qualifying patient or a designated provider of a qualifying patient. And there were state rules that talked about how you could become that way. So, as I mentioned, that was July 1st. July 1st of 2013 is when we enacted that a moratorium and we enacted our interim rules. Well, three days later, the state released their draft rules. Um, part of the draft rules was that they, they released them in July. Um, they were going to be adopted in August and then become effective in September. What that did was it established these, these new rules established a specific licensing process of how you had to apply um, the parameters of what you were judged on, um, your criminal background history, a, a ton of uh, kind of checks and balances on the licensing. One of the things that they also included in their rules was that they only had a 30-day window in which you could apply for these licenses. They were really, uh, really afraid that they were going to get this mass amount of, of um, applications submitted, and they wanted to kind of control that. They wanted to keep that limited. Um, and one of the reasons that they did that is because they had limitations on the um, number of actual retail facilities that could be located within a city and a county. They also had um, adopted in the, with these rules kind of gross canopy square footage for production. They wanted to make sure that um, not everyone was growing out and, and growing, turning their, their houses and their yards and their buildings into grow operations. And so they limited the amount of um, actual grow area within the entire state. So one of the things that, that we were concerned with is that we had a moratorium on applying for licenses in the city of Bellingham. We adopted that two day, three days after this. We, we wanted to make sure that people still had the ability to apply for licensing. So we came back a month later um, with interim zoning for recreational facilities. Uh, what we did there is we knew that we had these draft rules out there. The rules had already kind of been vetted at the state level, um, and they were kind of going through this, re this extra review process for allowing people to comment on them. Um, we were definitely keeping a, a good track on what was happening with these rules, um, always making sure that we were um, getting notices about all the rules that were coming out. So. We felt pretty confident going in and enacting these, in, these interim rules. Um, again, what it did is it adopted common definitions. So we wanted to make sure the definitions that the, the city was using were, were the exact same as the definitions that the state were using. Um, we also had to determine where should these facilities go. So we looked back and we said, okay, right now our industrial zones manufacturing, growing, that makes sense. So if you're gonna be producing or processing marijuana, you should do that in an industrial zone. Now if you wanna retail, we didn't, we, going back to that map, we knew there was some pretty limited op, um, options there, so we wanted to make sure that we at least um, had the opportunity for people to sell elsewhere. So um, what we did with retail is we said you could do it in industrial or commercial zones 
and you were still subject to a thousand, that thousand foot buffer that was the original 502 rules. So again, that um, kind of put your retailing, that should go in a commercial zone, your growing, your manufacturing, that should go in an industrial zone. We kind of kept those zones together. Again, we also didn't feel it was appropriate for any type of marijuana operations growing to be outside. Um, so we required it to be an indoor operation. Um, one key thing uh, that I missed there is that we, we had had some concerns and some issues that uh, we dealt with down in Fairhaven regarding a operation. It was a medical collective garden at that time that was in a mixed use building. Um, we were receiving a tremendous amount of complaints about the smell from the retail operation, the growing operation that was happening on the first floor with residents up above. So we knew we need to, to draft some sort of rules regarding that as well. So we said, okay, you can't grow and you can't sell in a mixed use building, trying to separate those uses uh, again. Um, again, we adopted some some stronger nuisance language, some signage language, and then we also re required compliance with all of our building electrical, mechanical, and fire codes. So, 2013, 2016, lots have happened since then. Um, the city council, when you adopt interim zoning, you have to establish a time frame. Um, you can also renew and extend these interim zonings and rules and regulations. Um, we knew that at the state level, there was still a lot of rulemaking going on. There was still a lot of discussion about combining the two markets of medical and recreational. Um, we felt that we had some pretty strong interim rules and regulations in place that seemed to be working okay. Um, it was allowing people the opportunity to engage in the applications. Um, it was allowing people to get their medicine. It was allowing people to buy and to grow. So what we did, um, as we kept going back to the city council every so often, um, and it was every six months, to extend and renew our interim rules and regulations. Now, while we were doing that, um, again, there was this issue out there with the difference in, between the rules for medical and the rules for recreational. So the state legislature, um, after a lot of prodding from uh, local jurisdictions, state agencies, and the general public, um, they adopted the 2015 Cannabis Patient Protection Act. And what that did was it created comprehensive rules for all marijuana use. Um, it essentially combined the licensing for medical and, re and recreational into one. Um, some of the rules were effective immediately. Well, most of them were effective beginning July 1st of 2016. So at that point, we knew that, okay, we knew that part of the Cannabis Patient, Patient Protection Act said that collective gardens were no longer allowed. Um, and they were no longer allowed as of July 1st of 2016. Well, that was a year from the time that we were doing these rules. We said, well, okay, we don't want any other, we don't want any new collective gardens to try and open under our rules while this kind of comprehensive rulemaking is occurring. So the city enacted a, another moratorium on collective gardens. Um, again, these comprehensive rules that came out of the, uh, the 2015 Act um, gave specific licensing requirements. People that wanted to operate medical had to do it in the same context as a retail facility. So in order to do that, you had to get a medical endorsement in order to sell medical grade marijuana. Um, part of the, the change in this, this rule uh, also said that Bellingham currently only was allowed six retail licenses. Well, they wanted to make sure that there were enough opportunities for people, now that you're combining the recreational system and the, the uh, medical system, they wanted to make sure that there was enough opportunity for people to continue to get their medicine and their recreational marijuana. So what they did is they also upped the number of retail allocations for all of the cities and jurisdictions. And effectively, ours was bumped to 12. So they doubled the amount of retail operations in Bellingham. Um, they also established that those thousand foot rule buffers for medical uses. Um, and, and part of that legislation, as I mentioned, specifically prohibited collective gardens. Um, 
through this. And so one of the things we knew that we had about 10 operating collective gardens out in the city. And the city didn't take a actual uh, um, kind of, we didn't go after some of these, the, the operations that were already in existence because of all the, the rules had been changed so many times. We knew that the rules were probably going to be um, changing again. So we felt they're operating. Um, if we get a complaint about some, then we'll go ahead and, and look into them. But we didn't want to go in um, not knowing what the rules were going to be. Um, once the Cannabis Patient Protection Act was pack, passed, we knew exactly what was going to happen. So what we did is we wanted to be kind of proactive with these 10 medical um, distribution uh, businesses that were out there. Uh, we set up a process to send out three letters. One, we sent out the, a letter that just said, hey, you may not be aware of these new rules and regulations. Um, what they say is that collective gardens are no longer allowed, and in order to operate, you have to be licensed by the state. So we said, if you've got any questions, we are here to help you. We've got rules in place that we can help guide you um, in your business as well. Uh, that was kind of that first letter. Um, the second letter we sent out was kind of a, a, a follow-up saying, um, you've got about six months left before it, you actually have to close your doors. We want to make sure that you're still actively looking, um, or trying to apply for licenses, and if we can help you at that point, let us know. And then 30 days before uh, the July 1st deadline, we sent out a final letter saying, you need to comply or you will be subject to violations of both city and state laws. Um, luckily, all of our medical facilities closed their doors, um, combined with other stores, uh, moved locations. Uh, there were some that just ended up closing um, and not being able to reopen. Uh, some of them are still looking, trying to get licenses. Um, but we, we did have, there was one individual, uh, one operation that was still operating uh, past the July 1st deadline. Um, we worked with them. Uh, he was the, the business owner was very cooperative. We'd had a lot of discussion, um, he and I, and as well as the police department about what was going to happen um, come July 1st. Uh, we knew that he was trying to, he was trying to go through the proper channels. Um, he was filing for all of his licenses. He was in the right location. He had begun and started operation under our rules, so we were really trying to, to work with him. Um, unfortunately, uh, he ended up having to close his doors because he couldn't get a license, um, and all the other licenses had been adopted. Um, one of the things in response to these collective gardens, remember the idea behind the collective garden was so that you could come together, join forces, pool your resources into growing your own marijuana, medical marijuana. So what the, the CPPA did is it ended up creating a cooperative versus a collective garden. Um, it really dialed down what you could do as an individual um, regarding growing your own. And what the basis of these cooperatives are is that you can only have four patients or qualifying patients in a cooperative. You can only be in one cooperative at a time. Um, you have to actually pool your resources. It can't be just a financial contribution. You actually have to do work or provide um, some sort of material or you had to, it had to be something beyond a financial contribution um, to do it. You had, it had to be grown and conducted in one of the patient's residences in their houses um, and it couldn't be within a mile of a retail store. Um, they figured that if you were within a mile, you should be able to go to a store and get your own. Um, so those were kind of the, the, the main uh, rules about cooperatives. Uh, then in August of 2016, we actually, at the city council again, adopted uh, comprehensive interim rules. We took all the stuff that was in the, the, camp, the Cannabis Patient Protection Act, all the stuff that was in Initiative 502, anything that was left over from the original medical marijuana rules, and we kind of crafted them into one, inter one set of interim rules. Um, those are the rules that are in effect right now. They're still in effect and will be in effect until end of February, if I recall correctly. So our thought is what we want to do is we want to come forward now. We want to make our rules final. And in order to do that, it's a type six process, which requires pl uh, planning commission and city council hearings. Um, 
Just to give you an idea of what's out there now in the city of Bellingham, we actually, again, remember I mentioned we had 12 retail licenses. We have 10, actually when I wrote this, we had 10. Apparently we had um, the 11th one, um, I was told today uh, that they just opened. Um, I've got the locations on here um, of these facilities. Again, they're in our areas that don't allow, uh, or going back to that, that original map back here. You can really see where a lot of these uses are going to be allowed. Um, this is our industrial area. This is I-5. You've got James Street in Iowa. So there's several facilities located here. Um, in this small area of Samish Way, there's, some, there's two here. Um, and I'll show you the numbers on our production facilities. The vast majority of our production facilities are actually um, up in the Iron Gate area. We've got some that are under, uh, under construction up in the Guy and Meridian area and then off of the Pack Highway area as well. Um, oh, one thing I did want to know, uh, we do have tw 12 licenses. Um, we actually have 28 applications that have been filed with the state for licensing. Um, this is one thing that we're really tracking right now. Um, I believe, and other, other staff members that we've been working with believe that if we've kind of watched the rules and the progression of the rules on marijuana, what's happened is they seem to be coming more, it, the, the use of marijuana um, seems to be coming a little more mainstream. Going back to Initiative 502, a vast majority of the voters in Whatcom County actually approved or voted approval for this. It was one of the highest um, in, the, in the state. So clearly our citizens of our city and our county um, believe in allowing and using marijuana. Um, I think that's why we get this 28 operations. Again, I think with what's going to happen here is I think that you're going to start to see um, this become more mainstream. Um, in many of the discussions that we've had with city council, they've said, well, it's nothing different than alcohol. We don't have the we don't have rules and regulations on alcohol. How is it different from an alcohol? Alcohol is a drug. This is a drug. Um, so there's those types of discussions that are circulating around there. Um, because of that, I think people are starting to become um, a little more um, understanding of it. There's a lot more information out there about the impacts of marijuana use versus alcohol use. So I think that as a population, as a national population, we're starting to understand uh, more. Uh, you've got other states just within this last uh, election, I believe there was three, three more states that voted to um, legalize recreational use. Uh, I think that puts us up at eight states now that have rules uh, regarding recreational use. Um, and even more have rules regarding uh, medical use of marijuana. So I think what's happening, um, it's interesting, uh, you see uh, with all these polls that have been going back and forth with the, the most recent uh, election, um, at one point there was greater support um, of marijuana use in our public than there was for any of the candidates out there, um, as well as our existing president. And it was that's the, highest, the highest approval of any of our presidents was actually um, surpassed by the amount of people that said that they are okay legalizing marijuana. Um, so um, I have a feeling that these rules are going to continue to change for quite some time. Um, I think that as this happens, we're going to see new iterations of the rules at a state level and probably at a federal level as well. Um, that's the big unknown, though, obviously, is what's going to happen at the federal level. Um, so 28 different uh, applications. Um, from grow facilities out there, uh, production and processing, we actually have 19 producers with applications. There's 13 active. We have 25 processors with 21 active. Now, the state kind of um, separates these two. You have to get a producer license and a processor license and a retail license. So the 13 active and the 21 active, a lot of these facilities are actually producing and processing at the same time. So those numbers aren't as, they're a little distorted um, because they're, these businesses are doing both of them at the, in their operation. Um, 
again, most of them are in the Iron Gate area. Um, we do have some in Sunnyland. Um, some of the things that we've seen because of us uh, requiring them to go in industrial zones is that we've seen or we've heard about an increase in industrial land prices. So the property owners knew that, hey, this is going to be a big business out here. People are going to want to do it, so we have the ability to raise our rents. Um, and that's what we heard happened, is that there were a lot of industrial places that raised their rents um, in there. Uh, we also realized when you've got that many producers and processors just within the city of Bellingham, that starts to limit our land supply um, of, act, of different types of industrial uses. So this is one of those things that um, we're talking about right now. It's one of the things that I'm hoping that maybe you can comment on tonight about as well, um, because as we're tweaking it, there are some options that we have uh, to maybe um, decrease the amount of operations within the city of Bellingham. Um, again, kind of the next steps here, we'll be releasing our draft rules and regulations, including the staff report for uh, you and the community uh, to understand this. Uh, then we're talking about having the public hearings on December 15th. Um, that's a lot of information. Um, took me a long time to understand that. It's taken me since 2012 to understand that, and I still don't understand it all. So um, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have, um, and also talk about some of the, the issues that you may want to see. Um, one of the things that happened with the 2015 state rules was they said that local jurisdictions, that 1,000-foot buffer, they said you could reduce it down to 100 feet if you wanted to. Um, so that's something that we need to talk about, um, whether or not we want to reduce that buffer down to 100 feet for this. Why would we want to do that? Well, going back to that map, all those buffer areas get smaller, so that means that you may not have that concentration of these uses all in those certain areas. So the buffers may actually allow for more operations to go into, into um, a place. Um, what other jurisdictions, some other jurisdictions have done in order to kind of deal with the, uh, the grouping of these uses is they've said, well, you can't have another grow operation or you can't have another retail outlet within 100 feet or 500 feet of an existing one. So that makes sure that you're not getting these concentrations, but then once you apply that with those other buffers, you're really limiting the opportunity for these places. Um, so those are kind of the things that um, I think we need to talk about as a community of how we want to deal with this um, because we as a community get to determine how these rules go forward. Thanks, so, Kurt. Yeah. That was a lot of information. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's great. I think it's really helpful for us to see the backstory all the way back to 2012 when this all started because it hasn't been in front of the Planning Commission because of the emergency nature. Yeah, correct. So That is unique. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that's one of the, the rules for state uh, state laws because the, the land use uh, adoption for rules and regulations and development regulations can take a long time. Um, they allow you to go in and enact these emergency moratoriums. city doesn't do that very often. We've done it a, um, a couple times. We did it for marijuana. We also did it for uh, rules and regulations regarding the Lake Whatcom watershed. Um, so when you've got those really serious, potentially serious issues, um, the state has given us the opportunity to enact these. Cool. So I think we should just open it up for kind of an open discussion, and I'm sure there's questions for Kurt, and then we can um, just kind of see how it goes. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody want, Jeff, you want to start us off? Um, <clears throat> so with everything that's happened recently, it seems like there's sort of a gold rush mentality still out there of everybody trying to get together and get your permits and your licenses and get your operation up running and I would naturally expect some degree of consolidation over the next couple of years uh, where maybe not so many of those operations go forward. Has there been a sense or an analysis or experience in other areas that would um, I guess get to some answer on what a stable number of processors and retail operations would probably end up happening in Bellingham as opposed to the current shotgun scattering of everybody trying to get a business going? Um, that is interesting. Uh, we do know that there are, I don't know if you noticed the names on some of the, the, the businesses, but there are a couple, there are a couple businesses that own multiple um, 
operations out there. So we know that, that th that's happening. Um, one of the things that they did in the 2015 Act was they increased the number of retail applications and they also increased the amount that can actually be grown. Um, so they're still way below that. And when they were crafting the rules, there was a lot of studies based on um, at that time the perceived or what people, what they thought the consumption rates were. And so that's kind of where they, they said, well, and it, it, it's interesting um, because our, the city of Bellingham actually had um, a pretty high consumption rate. Um, we had the, the number of allowances of retail establishments was six. That was higher um, than a lot of other jurisdictions. I don't think even like Everett um, had less or the same amount as we did. So there was this research that went into it to establish those numbers. They realized, whoa, our area, um, as well as some other areas, uh, there was when those rules first came out, um, there was a high increase of people buying and growing in our area. Um, so they doubled those. Um, I think those numbers are still coming back if you look at the, the total sales at the state level. Bellingham is still, Bellingham, Whatcom County area is still relatively high. Um, there's still a lot out there that hasn't been, that are still coming online. So I think the market will be flooded a little bit with it. Uh, that's why early on those few businesses were so busy. Um, when they first opened up, it was incredibly hard for people to actually get product into their stores. Stores were running out of business um, as well. Um, so I, I think that, I think the market is going to kind of regulate that as time goes on. Um, I have a feeling that some of the stores out there may not continue. Um, maybe they'll be consumed by other uh, licensees that are out there. Um, We've, there's 28 people out there, 28 groups that still want to op open a license in Bellingham. So there's still that great demand. Um, whether or not all of these production and processing facilities and retail facility, facilities will be able to maintain once kind of the rest of the, the state builds out, I don't know. That, that's where we don't wanna, that's where you get the market is gonna take place. Um, and. and we'll have to just kind of wait and see. And so I think those rules are probably gonna to continue to change regarding the number of retail outlets, the amount that can be grown. Um, well, that's gonna be a market-driven factor. Yeah. Long-winded answer. Is there, a, is there a cap on the production licenses? for the, Like, did we get assigned a certain number of production? No, only the, only the retail is retail, the only thing yeah. that they put the cap on. So if you wanna produce or process, there's no, there's no, um, rules on that or numbers in a jurisdiction that they use that kind of total square footage for the state for the state for the whole so, state exactly yeah. so and we do we get a say in the we don't get a say in like the retail really i mean the state just says you, you get we've done the studies you get this many yeah well um part of the rule making that occurs is that the state does send out draft rules and regulations and we have the ability to comment on them um, if there's legislation that is occurring at the state level, then we have the ability to comment on that as well. And we have. Um, we've participated with the uh, Association of Washington Cities organization in doing a study. Um, we were one of, the, um, one of the jurisdictions that was kind of out on the forefront of this um, as well. Uh, there were a couple like down south in Spokane and us that were kind of leading the way. And so... Um, We've worked with AWC on this. Uh, we've talked, we've sent letters uh, to the Liquor Control Board regarding the rules and regulations and the, when they come out for draft comments. So we're constantly um, keeping an eye on that. Um, I get uh, uh, our legal department, our police department, as well as uh, our staff are on email listservs. So we get notices whenever they change the rules. And that's one of the unique things about this is that I would estimate that they're since um, since the adoption, I'd say there's probably maybe 80, 80 to 100 rules that have been created after the fact. Um, so you can see that uh, you start to go down this process of regulating this new industry and different things pop up all the time and they have the state has to go back in and address those rules. Everything from the types of um, pesticides that are used. How do you get rid of it? 
how do you transfer this stuff? Um, uh, there's just tons of, of things that you constantly have to think about. So, Pete? For the uh, hearing on December 15th, I would like you to, to bring a police representative to inform us on the social impact of Bellingham, sure. the police enforcement time that has been involved since the recreational uh, marijuana has been in, uh, introduced. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I didn't touch on it, but our police department has definitely been um, actively involved in everything that we do uh, regarding the rules. Um, they, some of the, I, some of the issues that they encountered uh, early on was the whole driving under the influence because they had to determine, they had to, many of them didn't know how to um, actually gauge that from a, from a specific marijuana perspective, marijuana use. Uh, so it, there was training of how you're, what you were looking for, how you were looking for it. Um, clearly they had, a, they had training in that, but it was, a, it was different now with the new rules. And one of the things that the, the states or the cities all um, commented on to the, the state was the funds because the cities were now having to go out and do extra enforcement. The cities were creating the new rules and regulations and we weren't seeing any of the money that was coming from the tax structure. That was another thing that changed. So the, the cities are now getting uh, some money uh, based on those taxes. We get our standard B&O taxes, but then we also get this money that comes from the state taxes as well. So that's helping um, with some of those issues. Uh, um, but there's definitely been an impact to our police department regarding marijuana, just as there is with alcohol um, as well. Lisa? I would like to see um, something drafted with consideration of allowing for medical, um, the ability to grow one or two plants outdoors taken into consideration, the crime reduction, um, prevention, like you know, greenhouse, you know, personal greenhouse, fencing, locking, um, also talking with law enforcement if they think that would be um, what that would look like within a neighborhood. I think possibly the benefits would be air quality control for um, inside a house, um, houses that are maybe being converted without proper, you know, electrical and wiring, I think of energy use. I just think um, with some of these grow um, co-ops going to the wayside, the assumption that um, you could walk down the street and go purchase it, it's, it's not inexpensive for someone who's on a limited income, might be using Medicare, but they need to have it for their um, you know, medical need and quality of life. So if there's a possibility where you can use the natural sunshine and you know, grow something outside, I think there are benefits to that, but I'd also like to see what would that look like and then also analysis on weighing the pros and cons of that possibility. Sure. Um, we did do that originally um, with, the, with the police department was involved in that as well. Um, one of the reasons that we chose to require it to be inside the house was because outside and um, people could get it. They could easily jump fences and they could steal it. Um, it was more accessible um, and it wasn't as hidden so more people would know about it. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that uh, we felt that if people knew about it then they're possibly more likely for it to be stolen. Um, and if it wasn't within the house it was outside. Those were some of the issues that we talked about and that was one of the reasons why um, we required the indoor grow and then also what we've been told is that our climate is not that conducive to it. Um, with medical marijuana it's very um, it's it's very interesting because the different types of strains and the cross-pollination um, the the growers of medical marijuana are they're really into it and they they really have prescriptive ways and they they want to make sure that there isn't this cross-pollination and the reason that they do that is so that they can get the kind of the quality product that they need. Um, so we can definitely explore that. Um, I'll contact, I have a couple contacts that I've made um, regarding 
for the use. So whenever I have questions, I call the experts, the people that are doing it. Um, so I'll call them and ask them whether or not it's a, a good idea to uh, allow that from just from a growing perspective. It would be interesting to see if um, if it's effective elsewhere or if it's problematic. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just more concerned about with some of the changes that have happened on the medical side and the effects on patients being able to really afford um, their medicine at this point and then the concern of growing indoors. Um, yeah. As you said that, you know, it, when it comes time for it to flower, um, not ideal and, and not necessarily inexpensive to grow properly indoors. Right. Do you get a discount if you're a medical patient when you go in? Is it like going to a pharmacy and you can get, I mean, obviously your insurance isn't going to cover it because federally it's still. Yeah, really that was one of the, um, the big issues that the, the medical folks had is because of these large taxes that were placed on the recreational. Part of that uh, 2015 state legislation changed the taxation structure a little bit. It brought it down, so it made it more affordable. Um, from that perspective, uh, you do have to have, you, in order to buy medical grade cannabis at a retail store, you do have to have a card and be entered into a registry um, so that the, the retail provider can check that. And if you are on that, if you have your card and you are on the registry, then you don't have to pay that retail tax. Still, I believe there's still distribution and other taxes that get tacked onto that, so it's, it's, not, cheap. Not, yeah. it's not a huge discount for an individual. You have yeah. like just yeah. basically your. I think it's a great question to pursue. Time. Yeah, I was just curious. It is. It's you know, and that that gets back to the the question that uh, Commissioner Brown asked about kind of that whole market and and what's happening at that level is that the thought. I mean, we since the stores initially opened to now, the, the prices have dropped dramatically. And that one has to do with um, the availability. It's, you know, it's simple, um, simple economics. At that time, not many people were producing. There wasn't a lot of it out there. Now, there's more and more and more that's being produced. So that's, there's more and more on the market. Gives people, buyers gives people the ability to pick and choose and that drops the, the price down. Um, so, the state believes that that's going to continue to happen overall, and that will continue to be um, happening from the medical side as well. All right. Garrett, any questions? Tom? Um, did, did I understand you correctly that um, we got a bunch of licenses because the studies think we're all stoners? <laughs> um, based on an assumed uh, um, usage, uh, we got a, a pretty high number of licenses overall. Okay. I, um, we were, I will just add to that, um, the first legal sale of recreational marijuana did occur in Bellingham, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, the retail things are only pot shops, period. I mean, you, you can't buy a can of Colt 45 or, or Diet Sprite or anything else. It's just correct. cannabis. Is yep. that correct? Yep. And there's different, that's one of the things there are definitely, a, there are a ton of different types of cannabis products out there. Um, everything from drinks to food um, to weed to um, liquid vapor. I mean, it's, it, there's a ton of stuff out there. That's for sale. Well, what, what I was getting at is, do you s foresee any time soon, um, in, in the next decade, where that would change and we would see cannabis in 7-Eleven? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it really depends, I think, as a um, citizenry of whether or not we start to accept this or whether we don't. And I think it'll have to do with the um, health studies that can be done now. Um, there's been some recent laws that now actually allow different testings and studies to occur, which you couldn't do that legally before. So there's a lot of, the, in this whole marijuana market, um, there's a substantial amount of change that's taking place. And it's happening daily and you know yearly. So 
I think that that's a discussion that our community will have and our nation will have at some point. You know, is it, are we going to become um, to where it's the same as alcohol? Um, some people already think it should be that. Will it continue? I'm not sure. Um, it's, uh, we, I've definitely seen when industry, when production facilities first started going in, we were getting a lot of um, calls and complaints about the smell. You know, this business next door to me is now growing and I can smell it all the time. And um, that's been something that I think people, it's one of those things that you have to get used to almost um, because it's something, it's just like coffee roasting. You know, I mean, people are out there coffee roasting and we get complaints about a coffee roaster, the smell that comes from the coffee. Um, when you do, when you produce and things, certain things produce different smells. Uh, so people have, I think, come to get, they're now more used to the smell of marijuana, just as they're more used to the smell of coffee roasting. And um, gas stations out in uh, the Iron Gate area. So I think that's gonna continue to happen. I think people are, will continue to either get more comfortable with it or they will continue to say, no, this is not a good idea. Yeah. And then you throw in the whole federal rules and regulations, what happens at the federal level. Um, that's right now, the states have some assurances because the, who is the attorney general rent, uh, sent a letter that says, if you're doing, if you've got a systematic way of licensing these facilities and keeping track of them and you're keeping them out of the hands of kids and children and you're not allowing cartels or any sort of um, criminal activity to take place, then we're gonna, we're gonna leave our hands off. Um, those, are, th those can change with the change in a presidency yeah. um, or even within a presidency. So we don't really know what's gonna happen. And, and that, the whole federal issue has caused a significant problem with the financial side of these millions and millions of dollars that's being collected um, at these places. You had, um, because it's essentially a cash only, uh, the banks are federally, they've got, they have to abide by federal rules and the federal rule says you can't have, you, know, you can't deal with money that's um, drug related. So in order to purchase and stuff, you've got to go out and um, get cash. Then these stores have all this cash on hand. They have to take it in bags, and then they take it down to Olympia. You know, I mean, it's 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 crazy. Um, there ha there has been at a state level and in other states as well, um, groups forming kind of their own almost banking institutes that are um, even some of the local banks are starting to get a little more loose on it. They're starting to allow for financing um, and taking some of that money. So again, I think that it's all this changing um, new <laughs> uh, way of life. So. Can I ask you another question? In your opinion, what would be the appropriate buffer? 1,000 feet, 500 feet? Um, 250. We've talked a lot about that. Um, one of the things that the new state rules says is that you can reduce the 100 feet, but you can't reduce it for schools, playgrounds, and parks, I think. Those are the three that you can't. So those other ones like recreation centers, a recreation center is like the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club, um, or child, uh, child care centers. You, um, you can reduce for those transit centers, you can reduce for those, but you can't for those others. And so I think as a state, we're still not okay reducing those buffers on certain uses because there's a higher concentration of kids and they can start to see it at that point. Um, one of the things that I, that I do think we could reduce is for the production and processing facilities. Having a thousand foot buffer for the production and processing facilities, I don't think it really gets at the intent of the buffer. Um, typically, you don't have a lot of kids walking streets near industrial areas. Um, many of the, the ones that, if you were to drive out into Iron Gate, you wouldn't even know that they're there um, because they don't have signs out. Um, there's a smell every once in a while that comes with some of them. There are also ways to, deter, uh, to um, eliminate the smell, charcoal, coal filters, and things like that, that a lot of these industries are using. So they're not, you're not even smelling it when it's growing. So um, from that perspective, I think, I think that's something that we as a community need to explore. And that's something that I've 
um, identified in our rules where I want the Planning Commission, the public, and the City Council to weigh in on. We have the ability to reduce it. Is it okay to redo it for production and processing? Um, and if even from our council's perspective or from the Planning Commission's perspective, if you want to reduce that in other areas, that's, that's a discussion we need to have. Personally, I think, um, I think from a retail perspective, I don't know if our community is there yet. Maybe they are. Maybe they will come out and they will say we're ready, it's okay. Um, a lot of the taxation, the money that's coming from the taxation is going into education. There's a ton of education out there now. So um, it, that's, that's something that I think we as a community need to decide. Right. Yeah, my, my question was on the, the buffers too. I think we should really look at that carefully. There's some concerns when you have such a restrictive land, you know, some r land use patterns. You look at the, that map. What's that do to non-cannabis retailers when they're in a cannabis region? You know, what's that do to their rents? If you're trying to, you know, have a coffee manufacturing facility or a retail of another use, but there's a certain square area where, you know, the cannabis can be located, seems like it could raise rents disproportionately and kind of throw that market out of equilibrium. So the other thing too with the retail, with the buffers from schools, you know, I don't know if the intent's really being met there anyway. If you look at going down James Street, there's a couple retail facilities that if you lived in Sunnyland and you walked to Bellingham High School, you're going to go past three of them. And there's a there's a pedestrian crosswalk that's lighted and you got to pass two of them to go through that crosswalk to walk to school. So I think we need to look at those buffers and try to be reasonable about them and come up with reduced areas so that, you know, that's not so restrictive, uh, you know. Yeah. Lisa? Garrett pretty much uh, targeted exactly what I was going to say. I would like to see a map of what it would look like for a 500 foot for the retail, mm -hmm. um, taking into consideration the 1,000 foot requirement for the schools and such. And I'd also like to see what a map would look like for the 100 foot for um, the industrial, because my concern is, is that if it's such a small little footprint, it does drive up that cost. And out in that Iron Gate area, there are other industrial uses that I would hate to see driven out of there because that property becomes too valuable. And um, so I'd like to see what that would look like um, because I do think um, it's not going to go away. And if it is an industry that is, and I'd, I'd kind of like to have a little bit of an idea of um, the employment levels, like what kind of job area is in the industrial and what type of wages are being paid if there's a way to get that information because we're constantly looking at what is considered a livable wage and where is industry not that i want bellingham to be primarily just a big grow up and that's you know our resources but i'd like to know what kind of um, community impact that's having as far as for jobs and then also tagging on a little bit with what Steve had stated, I would like to, other than the negative impact as far as law enforcement, I would like to have some data on perhaps the, um, are there less arrests overall? You know, is there any, um, as far as law enforcement, is there um, beneficial because of the legalization? As it, far as, you know, less people in jail, uh, less people going through the courts, um, law enforcement able to utilize a certain amount of their um, people forces towards other um, areas of crime. So if Bellingham's been keeping track of that at all, um, I would like to maybe see that data too presented. It's a really good point. I and mean, we hear a lot about um, how much of our jail population is in there for crimes like possession. And not locally, I just mean nationally. Right. And yeah, I wonder if it'd be interesting to see if there was a you know, an effect locally on that. that and but with the, um, sorry for interrupting, no, but with the uh, adoption of the rules, there were specific possession limits that were allowed. So before we didn't have possession limits where now you can have up to an ounce on you. So I think I would make a large assumption here is that those arrests have probably gone down because what was not 
legal is now legal and it's legal up to a certain percentage. So you can have it on you as long as you're 21 years of old. You can't smoke it in public. Um, you still have to do it within the confines of your house, but you can have it on it. So those possession, possible possession amounts have probably gone down. Real quick, I wanted to follow on your two comments just on that topic of the b buffers and looking into that. I think those were really good comments. And just one other thing that I think should be thrown into that consideration is the perception effect. If we if we limit the area, so, well, there's only 12 licenses. If we limit the area so much, they're all going to be in one area and people are going to go, man, there's all these weed stores on Samish. Mm -hmm. And if we relax that a bit, we diffuse the max cap of 12 over a larger area. It might not feel like there's so many. And I think that m might be another reason to consider la laxing up a little bit because it just from a perception standpoint, it might help um, if we balance that correctly. So all right, anyway. Well, that's a good point. I, what, uh, when I'm looking at the restriction of, you know, the area where those businesses can be located, what about the reciprocal effect if you wanted to start like a vocational school and, you know, you wanted to put it into a certain area where there's three retail outlets, does that vocational school now render those non-conforming uses or would you not be able to apply for a permit to build a, a school or it took the state a really really long time to answer that question because we asked it very early on what happens that when we get these licenses and, and their response is that once you receive a license you're kind of it's you're like any other use you're kind of considered grandfathered as long as you don't have a lapse in your license as long as you're renewing your license and you're not having any violations you can continue that so what that means is that if a school goes in 100 feet from a retail operation, then they can continue to renew their licenses because they were legal when they were established. Could they expand their footprint? Good question. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those kinds of things will come up. Mm -hmm. You know, and the other thing with restricting the areas, as this number goes from 12 to 30 to unrestricted generally, then you know how nimble could we be in drafting our regulations to you know accommodate that? And that, that was my next question: is like, as this is changing so rapidly, we're going to adopt these rules and regulations, and then they're final, and we have to go through the Type Six process here. That's that's arduous. The interim allows you the flexibility. So right. how much how much maneuvering can you do within? a fixed set of regs. Well, I think that um, that's one of the reasons that we continue to, to, to do the extensions and the renewals of, this, of these interim use zonings because the, the rules were changing daily um, and we didn't want to have to go through this process multiple times. Um, that being said, we, took, we spent a lot of time crafting the rules and regulations that we have out there now so that we're, we're hoping that we were doing a good job in the long term. Um, I think that one of the things to keep in mind, one of the ways to deal with the concentrations is again, you can require a certain distance between uses. So that would be, it's, it's something that we've started the analysis of. Um, we've got maps of the 500 and the, the, the 100 foot buffers. We've got those maps already done. Um, we don't have maps having a specific distance between individuals. Um, uses, so it'd be interesting to reduce the buffer down to 100 or five or 500 and then require 100 or 200 feet in between them and see what that does from an overall land availability perspective, I think. Um, and that's something that we can definitely do. Uh, so that's, that's one of those ways you get away from that concentration because in that James, Ohio, Iowa area, we actually have two, three, I think five five stores within probably maybe a five block radius. So, so that that in itself may, you know, we can look at that to see what kind of distribution we have, what the distances are between those stores, what that would mean elsewhere. Um, I, I guess where I was going with that is like anticipating further changes, which I think there will be, and we're gonna draft this ordinance. How much room do we have to leave flexibility or administrative approval or and not be so fixed into trying to map everything out to a hundred foot here and this not would, being that It would specific. be challenging to leave the rules flexible enough to allow for that. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we do is 
we waited a long time. We've got some pretty good rules in place now um, from a licensing perspective. Unless the state allocates more retail licenses, we're not getting any more in the city of Bellingham. Um, so that gives us a little bit of time. Um, if the state comes back and says, Bellingham has 30 licenses now, we still have that ability under the state law to enact interim zoning or a moratorium. So we can stop it and kind of maintain that status quo while we look at the impacts that that may bring with it. So we have that ability to, once we have those rules on the record, we have the ability to use the moratoria or the interim rules in place to, if, if it meets the criteria in, in order to do that, we've got that ability to stop it again. So. Lisa? I think a dispersion rule would actually help address that so that the moratorium wouldn't have to be out there too long. That if there was something on the books that stated so many, you know, like so much distance in between, and if those boundaries are well defined, and if you have an area, say on Samish, that is only so big and it already maxes out what is there, then someone who is going to get a license is going to look for somewhere, someplace else. Um, so I think that gives a little bit of the flexibility for growth if Bellingham goes in that direction. Is I, I think that would be an important component to look at. It's a good question. I had a star next to it. Can we set the rules up to be adaptive to future federal and state regs? And I don't know. I know we can't do so much, but something for us to be thinking about is like, it's a really good point, Lisa. Like how do we how do we make them broad enough that they could accommodate change just, from, could, the, just you, from the numbers perspective. You could probably um, do, I mean, there's other ways that you could deal with it. You could deal with it like through a conditional use permit process um, or you could deal with it. You may be able to draft, craft some sort of like director ability to modify um, that. So there, there may be some language in there. Um, comes with a lot of unknowns though. So that's the, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I just think we should look as drafting this ordinance, we should look at ways that within reasonable means that we can have mm -hmm. language in there that supports flexibility because th these are gonna change. I mean, they're, they're, they're just gonna. And we deal with this on all our ordinances. You, you have a, a very rigid set of ordinances and then circumstances change and we're always playing catch up. Right. We're behind a year, two years. I mean, it's a problem when we say we got to deal with it. Yeah. We're, we're that far behind all the time. So maybe drafting this one on the early end, we can maybe try to work that in where we can. Kurt, um, I had two questions. Sure. Uh, well, one of them was just more like a statement, maybe a question. We, uh, Tom commented on how we're, and you commented on how we're like up near the top. Do you think that there's some tourism component from Canada because we're right here? Uh, definitely influencing like our consumption numbers definitely and is there like an economic element to that do you think that we need to be considering like, there and um, I, don't, I don't know what that means I'm just it seems like it's not legal in Canada There's two three million people right up there they're probably coming down here to buy weed I think that's one of the reasons that the state allocated us a higher number is because that was going to happen they felt that that was yeah. going to happen um, so um, I other states have looked at it from a tourism perspective um, where they're, I mean, they're actually going out and marketing for it. Um, that's causing issues because you get a lot of influx from different states, people from different states, they buy it and then they go back across the state where it's not legal. Problem. Yeah. There's actually um, a federal case right now uh, against Oregon by the surrounding states because their uh, marijuana possession cases has skyrocketed because people are coming into the state, buying it and going out and getting busted. Um, so we've, we've had, I know that there has been some concerns with uh, Washington State as, or Idaho as well. Um, we obviously won't have that from Oregon anymore because they're now, all, it's mm -hmm. now legal there. Um, so there's definitely um, a tourism component to it, whether or not we're going to, as a state, going to market towards that. Um, there are rules and regulations in the state law regarding um, kind of advertising, and I think that that's, that's a topic that's still being debated um, throughout the states of whether or not our rules actually allow for people to do that or not. Um, and then you get this whole free speech component that plays into that, and so it's, a, it's a, again, a very complicated um, issue. Um, I can check. I don't, I'm not sure 
regarding our from our tourism like board and stuff whether or not they've talked to but I can check in with our I'm, folks on that I know you can't own you can't be a uh, like a production processor licensee and a retail Correct. right yep so is there some restriction on those facilities to be co-located in Bellingham or anything like that there are no rules at the state level or the local level regarding co-location okay we actually have one that has a grow in the back it's in a uh, retail in the front one two building, separate two separate two yeah. separate entities i just think about different. those issues when i think about that tourism i'm not suggesting by any means that we promote bellingham or walker county as like a weed place but i'm just saying that might you might find people who are out there saying, hey, we want to be like the Tillamook Cheese Factory of this, and we want to have like a production facility and partner with a retail group person and have people come in and buy T-shirts and watch the process through a glass wall and, you know, that kind of thing. And I, we should think about those kinds of future activities when we draft this so we don't either make it impossible or make it like to, you know, do something that could get us in trouble yeah, with right. the state rules, right? right. So I, just, just something to throw out there that that someone had, um, in actually in Blaine had brought up that, that yeah. they were pursuing that kind of concept. I was, yeah, I was going to comment on that. We actually had some people that um, were looking at a property out in Iron Gate to kind of do this, exactly that kind of this. Come here, see how it's grown. We've got five warehouses on our property. You can walk through different stages and see how things are operating. Um, so they. That has been discussed already here. Um, how they were proposing it and marketing it, they, they couldn't meet the rules and regulations. Um, so I knew it wasn't going to, <laughs> to work unless our rules got, our state rules got changed. Um, but yeah, that's de it's definitely an interesting component. I think that that's something that we had. We've had, uh, one of the things that we had to deal with was, uh, I think they called it the Weed Expo where um, they have expos where you can come and see all the different kinds of marijuana. You can look at how um, the different types, you can look at, um, they sell different paraphernalia that comes along with it. So they've, they've had some of those down, um, down south. Uh, so how do, you, how do we deal with the weed expo? That's a really good point. I didn't mm. think about that one, so. Like a convention <laughs> yep. of sorts? Yeah. Um, well, you commented on advertising, which was my only other question. I was curious if you could give us some more information on what kind of restrictions we have on signage and advertising locally, and then maybe if there's anything unique about the state saying. The state actually has a more restrictive, in our industrial zones, our signage limits, our rules and regulations are pretty broad. They allow quite a bit of signage in industrial zones. Um, but the state limits that, the state limits the amount of signage to two, 1600 square inch signs um, I can't I don't I can't convert that right at this moment but um, it's a 1600 inch square sign is not that big um, if you go by like if you see any of the stores out there now they're all in compliance with it um, okay. trove on sandwich is a really good example I know that they've got their monument sign and then they've got a, a sign up on top um, and they're those are the types of signage that the state rules comply with or have in place. Um, that actually has been a local enforcement issue because the state, well, there's, I mean, if you drive by some of the other places, we've got facilities that have banners, flags, yep. everything uh, <laughs> Commissioner Crooks doesn't like. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So uh, we, there uh, are uh, several businesses out there that have signs that I know comply with our local rules, but they don't comply with the state rules. And the state, from an enforcement perspective, is really relying on the local jurisdiction to do a lot of that enforcement. And, our, and we don't have special sign regs for the marijuana business. They just use like the standard sign regs locally? Yeah, locally. Right. So when we, when we looked at that, uh, we actually do have interim sign regulations. And it starts with that 1,600 cap. Um, but if the 1,600 cap uh, square inch cap is more than what our local regulations they have to abide by our local regulations um, it's just it depends on the zone that we're in yeah. right now so that's, I think that's an important component and like when we talk about exposing kids and, and stuff you know we don't advertise cigarettes on TV right and there's all sorts of rules in mag in print regarding alcohol and how we advertise 
drugs effectively. And like, I, you reminded me of it, Garrett, when you commented on kids walking. If you drive, I don't know the name of the street, but if you drive past, like between Assumption and Bellingham High School, that street that runs over to James, yeah, you know, you drive along that street and the, the weed shop that's like two blocks away has a sandwich board on the corner that says, with a big arrow, that says, come down this street to buy, you know, to buy it. And I know that's an enforcement issue. I know we've talked about it in context of Steve's comments, how hard it is, but you know, it's just important if we're gonna, if we're gonna say, hey, let's, let's loosen up everything, locations and stuff, we might wanna look at if there's a way to get more teeth and people not complying. I know that one of the folks on Samish managed to get a, a billboard and I know that that's not legal, and it was a huge, I mean, yeah. I know you guys can't, can only do what you can do about it, but I just think it's worth discussion as we move forward, especially if we talk about making them in more locations, you know, really making sure that they're not out there, like, putting it in people's faces, because you don't, you know, I don't know, when yeah. we had liquor, when we had the liquor stores controlled by the state, it was like a tiny, you know, it said liquor store in red on the door, and that's, like, about all you had, and people who needed liquor knew where to go. Agreed. Um, that's a, it's, uh, if you go out and look at the, if we stick with liquor, there are a lot of signs out there, um, even in like window signs and things like that when you yeah. go to the businesses that, that kids are subjected to. And I think that's, that's some of the, the issues that the education component that the state requires is trying to do. Um, I personally, I have a 13 year old son. Um, he's asked me all kinds of very interesting questions that how is, you know, someone that as a parent of a young child, um, growing up in a completely different world than I grew up in, um, how do you explain that something that was an absolute no is now, well, yes, it is when you get to be this age. Um, he's asked me uh, questions about, well, why can, why when we go into certain stores, I can see alcohol all over the place and I can be with you and you, you know, buy that. But the, from the marijuana stores, it's, it's different. Um, so I think that's, our, the state legislature understood that there was going to be those types of issues and that's why they focused that certain amount of money into the education component um, and that's part of our responsibility is educating the youth about the pros and cons and then until we have maybe a national opinion on it that's going to be a very challenging issue for quite some time thanks anybody else all right i think we'll look forward to seeing what you come up with Great. Um, there are some several things here that may take a little bit of time. So um, with that December 15th, in order to meet our getting the, the draft ordinance and the packet and all that information out two weeks in advance, um, I may not be able to make that date depending on what the other departments can get me, information and stuff like that. So um, I'll probably know within the next week of whether or not we can put all this information together in time for um, getting the information out, uh, but just in case, if we can't do the 15th, I think the next one is the January 5th. Heather, if you could help me on that one. Yeah, January 5th would be the, the next day. So depending on how much, how quickly we can get um, some of this information, um, especially since I'm gonna be contacting some of the, the private folks. Do you anticipate just one public hearing, or do you, are you anticipating more? What kind of public involvement and comment have you had to date? Well, um, it's interesting. We we didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, I think one of the one of the things that since we've had these interim rules and regulations in place, um, people have had the opportunity to come out and talk about it. Um, when we first enacted the moratorium and the interim rules, there was a ton of people. We had a, um, several very large. Part of adopting uh, interim rules and moratorium, the, the rules say you can do it without any public notice. You can do it at a night meeting. But then within 60 days, you have to have a public hearing on those interim rules. And the council then has the ability to um, cancel them, uh, if change them, modify them, or do whatever, uh, or keep them in place. So when we first enacted those, those rules, we had um, a couple of um, pretty uh, interesting uh, public hearings. There was, a, especially when you had the rules for the medical side and the recreational side, we had a lot of folks that were medical patients that didn't like the rules, um, that 
had issues and concerns about being able to get access to it. And so they, a lot of them came out and expressed their concerns with the city council level. Um, now I think things have kind of, you know, kind of regulated themselves out a little bit. People are a little more okay with it. Um, a lot of the rules from the, you know, looking at the number of retail, we've already got 12. We're not gonna get any more. So at least at this point, so that's not going to change. Um, a lot of the rules that we're looking at, this, the local jurisdiction can't really change um, because of the state rules. So in order to make it, make, allow more people more, more access to it, we don't have that ability to override the state rules. So I think a lot of the issues that come with these have already been dealt with or are being dealt with at a state level. So. Um, I, I, I honestly, I think that we can do it in one here. I think you, we will go through the rules. You'll see the, how, what, what's been working for the last couple of years and then obviously some different information. Um, maybe people will have some comments on the buffering uh, and reducing the rules, the, the distances there. So I can definitely see people wanting to discuss that. All right. Okay, then with that, we will close the meeting for tonight on that topic and um, we do have a little business. Um, there was a Shoreline Committee meeting tonight, and Steve would like to give a recap for all of us. So Steve, if you wanna talk about it, there was four items. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. we had four items tonight presented before the uh, uh, Shoreline Subcommittee of this uh, commission. Uh, the first one was the construction of a 37-foot addition to an existing building at Marine Heritage Park. The second one was development of a single family pier and float, including two new pilings and reuse of one existing piling on Lake Wadcombe. The third one was construction of a launch route for vessels that are manufactured by All American Marine Facility currently under construction. Those, those items were approved and will be transmitted with the recommendation of approval to the planning community community development director for consideration. The fourth and last item was finally a, a proposed transportation safety improvement project at the current James Street and Woodstock Way intersection. That required a shoreline variance. That one will be forwarded to the uh, ecology department in Olympia for action. Uh, that was approved. And that's the end of the report. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on those? All right, thanks, Steve. Okay, uh, our next meeting is TBD because we'll see if... Actually, Heather just reminded me, um, in order to continue the discussion, it needs to be a date certain. So what we will plan on is December 15th. Yes. And if we don't meet December 15th, then we'll just start the process over and do all of our re-noticing and such again at a different... Okay, so. so the plan is next meeting December 15th on this topic, and that is our next meeting, correct? Yeah, no, none in early December. All right, thanks, Kurt. It's a lot, lot to, for you to uh, take in over four years, <laughs> but you never thought that would happen. <laughs> thanks, all right, we'll, we'll adjourn, thank you.